So anyhow, welcome. It's a wonderful Monday evening, March 30th. And today is going to be a basic 3D overview. Okay, now the next couple classes are also going to contain 3D as we try to bring it all together based on this class, uh, this evening's class. The thing about uh, 3D is a very key component of After Effects. Up until this point, we've been dealing with 2D, meaning that things can go right, left, and up, down. And that is the main deal. Now, most of the things that we've covered um, so far in the semester, we've got a, uh, things can be uh, done in other software, such as Premiere, and even some of the things we've done could technically be done in Photoshop as well. This is where After Effects breaks out and becomes its own thing, getting into the 3D environment. Now, a few things I do want to bring your attention to before we really start going here is, up until this point, let me zoom in, we've been dealing with everything in the 2D environment. The first number and the second number, X and Y, X and Y, all the way through and we only have the one type of rotation and stuff. Even the anchor point is, even though it's set to zero, zero right now is X and Y. Okay, now how do we, oops, should have stayed zoomed in. How do we get into the 3D environment? Now across the top here of our timeline, you'll notice a whole series of icons. Each of these represents what the column below it does. If the column below it's blank, it means that this item has not been activated yet, okay? The 3D cube here represents how to activate the 3D layers. Now, the one thing I do wanna point out to you before we go any further is After Effects does let you mix together both 2D and 3D layers. Until you have this down, don't mix them, okay? It will drive you absolutely nuts because the rules of X and Y, the 2D rules and 3D rules mixing together are really crazy making. Basically up until you get really good at this, I would say have everything 2D or have everything 3D. Don't try to mix it, you know, the whole thing. So to make something 3D, I'm just going to go click, 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 click. I could also just hold down my mouse and move it around. And that activates the 3D of each of those layers. Now, for example, if I now open this up, notice how things have changed dramatically. Now, I, under position, anchor point, everything else, I have X, Y, and now I have a third option here, which is Z. Z if X is right, left, and Y is up, down, Z is represented by forward and backwards closer to the camera, farther away from the camera. And also notice that my rotation has shifted as well. I now have three options of rotation, again, along the X, Y, and Z rotation. If you recall that globe filter that we did, you know, two weeks ago, basically the thing about that rotation is, the X rotation is when the pivot point how the thing will rotate is across the x-axis. It's not talking about how the letter moves. So for example, there's my anchor point in the lower left-hand corner. How do I know that? Is because actually the, another thing that's been added is this thing that we call the whirly gig, which is this green, red, and blue arrows. And I'll get back to that in just a second. But with the x rotation, you can see that I'm now having a barrel roll as the thing comes closer and farther away from me. And people go, but Eric, your letter A just vanished. Aha. Yes, that's true. And I'll talk about that in a second. Y rotation has the letter rotation going up, down. So it will spin like a pinwheel, not pinwheel, weather vane, like so. And once again, notice that it vanishes again. And finally, the Z rotation has that coming straight out that blue line straight at you. So if I do this, now that's the more traditional one that we're used to, as you will see. 
Okay. So it's just one more thing to keep track of. Now, the other thing that's different with the 3D world that After Effects has is up until this point, down in our timeline, the order of these layers was critically important. Okay. Meaning the top layer is the first thing the audience would see. This is then the second layer, then the third layer, then the fourth layer. Once you've activated the 3D tags on that layer, that's changed. From now on, the change is that the Z position has priority, which is closer to the camera and which is farther away. Now, right now, all these shapes, letter A, there we go. All these things are literally on top of each other. Okay, because they came from a 2D world when I placed them. So that means that if I take the position Z and push it away from me, it's now hiding behind this grid that I created, the green and red grid. If I bring it forward, whee, it's now farther away. So let me set that. So that is why when I rotated it, as it rotated, it was going, that's toward the camera, and then it goes behind the, behind the other grid, and then back over again, and then we can see it one more time. Okay, so far so good. You guys, is that good for everybody so far? Now, one of the things that we want to do with this is it's hard to see what we're working with. Because right now we're looking at the key straight on. And down here below in the viewer. Yep, we, until you know what you're doing, the question from, uh, this is for the video down the road, question from the chat is, we don't wanna mix 2D and 3D, correct? And the answer is yes, do not mix 2D. And this is referring just to the layers themselves. Right now, these are all, you know, basically one pixel thick items. So we're not referring to objects at this point. We're just referring to the 2D and 3D layers. Don't mix them together until you get the hang of how to properly do that because it can be very crazy making. Okay, getting back into this. Down below here, we have all these options down below for our viewer. You know, for example, I can say, fit to 100% or I can do a whole zoom. This is where I can zoom in and zoom out. All that fun stuff. There's a lot of the buttons here, which I won't talk about tonight. But remember, I, there was one down here, the checkerboard, which gives transparency. And then to the right of transparency is the view. Right now, what we're seeing is what's called the active camera. This is exactly Okay. okay, sorry, I'm trying to read the talk and read the chat at the same time, which is always a challenge. Uh, I will get back to the mixing 2D and 3D. I'm talking only about layers at this point, okay? An object is what's on a layer, by the way. The difference between a layer and an object is these are all layers, and on each layer is an object. It might be a photograph, might be a solid, might be a video, or you might import 3D objects from other software. But this is what makes the layers two or 3D, just hitting those little cubes right there. Okay, now getting back into what you're looking at. Now, here's where it becomes critically important for everybody. And this is a mindset thing in the sense of, right now, I want you to think of what we're looking at as looking through the viewfinder of a camera, okay? be it your cell phone, be it a traditional camera, whatever. Okay, right now what we are viewing is the key, what the audience is going to see, hence the term active camera. Now I want you to imagine that that camera is sitting on a tripod. Okay, everybody with me so far? Meaning that you don't have, have to physically touch it. Now the reason we're using this analogy is because when you get into doing After Effects, in the th with 3D layers, you have the ability to step back from the active camera and to view things as if you were walking around a physical set, okay? 
meaning that I can view things from different angles. Now, this is the mindset situation that comes out. You have to separate out those two, th you know, the view of the audience versus your view of what you're seeing. This takes a little while getting used to. I've had some students who have trouble with that from time to time, but it really is important. So for example, from this drop down menu, I can change my view from what the audience is seeing to stepping back and seeing it. So I can see this from the top. Wow, that really is a different view. Right now you can see that I have all my layers, but they're all one pixel thick. Now, if I go back to rotating my uh, letter A here, look what happens. There's me rotating that layer. Whee! So I can see it, but you can see that all these layers are literally one pixels right on top of each other. So that is what the top view looks like. The back view is, you know, most of these are pretty self explaining Left view is literally, I'm looking at the left side. I've literally left my camera on the tripod. I've walked around. I'm looking straight on from the left-hand side. And once again, they're only one pixel thick. So, and I can do the same thing from the back, right, bottom. The views down here, which are really handy, are what they call the custom views, which allows me to see things from a three-dimensional angle. So I can see it from here. I can see it more head-on, or I can see it from custom view, which is the right-hand side. So that's the difference between one, two, and three. I'll go back to number one. Now keep in mind, this is radically different than what the audience is seeing. That is camera. This is what the audience is seeing. So you have to get these two things straight in your head, is what the audience see and what you see. So for example, when I do the rotation now, you can see how it rotates around, then goes behind the other one, behind my grid, comes back into it and voila. Okay. So that is getting used to that. Now we use these other views to help us line things up because the human eye is very easily fooled. You know, it's hard to tell where things are going to be placed and how that they're going to be set up. So we have to often switch these things to go back and forth and then finally back to the, what the audience is seeing. Now, one of the things that's great about this is the next button to the drop down menu to the right, which allows us actually to set up multiple views. So for example, I always recommend for beginning two views horizontal. Now this, what happens is I then gets, has me two cameras. Now let me take a step back from 3D and just explain these two different uh, setups. Now this is where some subtlety comes in. If I click on the right hand view, notice that it says active camera and notice that there's little blue tags in the corner. Yeah, microscopic, can you see them? There they are, there's the blue, blue tags. Man, those are hard to see. But that's conveying information to you. That's telling you that all the settings down here below are shown to be the ones on the left-hand side because that's where the blue tags are. Notice that this is set to 50% of the original size. When I click on the right-hand side and put the blue tags over here, notice that's now 29.3% of the size. That's why they look different at this point. When doing 3D work, I always recommend keeping one of the views as the camera and then allowing yourself to switch, make the other view a custom view. So this is what the audience is seeing and this is what the, uh, you're seeing. You have stepped away from the camera. Basically, a question from the chat room is, would you mind repeating that? How did you split the views? To the right of the camera, which view you're setting at, there's another drop down menu, which allows you to split the views into multiple things. So you can split it two views horizontal, two views vertical, four views. For you architecture students who would like to have things uh, really split out, I personally find just two views horizontal is plenty handy. Now, if you have more than one monitor, then of course go hog wild, put the entire viewer onto its own monitor and it allows you to work 
from there. Now, so what does this do and what the, can I do with this? Well, I can grab and move things any way I want to with this. I mean, I can play with the numbers down in my timeline or I can literally grab this object and move it any way I want to. Whoops, I wanna grab the grid. I wanna click on my letter A, there we go. You can see I can push the letter A way behind my grid or I can bring it forward in front of my grid. How do I know that's in forward of the grid? Well, I could look at the sizes and know that my Z is at a different size, but I can also change this to like left-hand view. You can see that's how far forward my letter A is compared to all the other objects in here. And I can also grab it here, et cetera. Oops. Back that up just a hair. All right. Now, one of the reasons I made this green and red grid was I'm actually going to use it in just to show you, I'm selecting both. Basically, just to give you so when you open this up and see these files, I have a blue background or a green background by itself. Then I have a this thing called Royal Blue Solid which isn't, as you can see, is not royal blue because there's a filter called grid, which made this grid for me. And I made basically it green and red just for good contrast so you guys can see this. Now I'm going to make these two things a floor. Okay, I'm going to make it literally what it sounds like. It's going to be the bottom of what my scene is going to be. So I'm just going to hit the letter R on my keyboard for rotation. Now I'm going to want to pivot yeah, actually that is confusing. Rename. Grid. There we go, much better. Okay, so I'm gonna go select both of these again. Now, if you recall, if I wanna make this a floor, I'm gonna to wanna to flip the two layers together. So I wanna actually use the X. Why? Because I know that the line goes through right, left, and that will give me the this motion. See, I'm flipping this around. So I'm just going to go, I'm going to make that 90 degrees. There we go. So as you can see, there's my 90 degrees from the camera's point of view of my grid. And how do I know it really is 90 degrees? Well, obviously I typed in exactly the number I want, but also on my left view, you can see that it pivoted directly 90 degrees compared to my letter A and my little man that's standing there. And if I want to take a look at it on this left-hand side, I'll switch, oops, switch that to custom view. So it gives me that wonderful view there. Okay, so that's my grid. As a matter of fact, I'm going to lock it down. I'm going to just hit the lock symbols, which is in every Adobe product. Go back to my letter A. Now, Moving this around is really straightforward. I can, of course, just type in the numbers I want or just change the numbers here. So if we want to go forward backwards, I can just use the Z space backwards and forwards to make it go forward and backwards. I can also grab the physical letter itself in any of these two viewers. So I'll go do the, from the camera view and I can move it around this way. Very random. You know, you can even go through the floor here. I should point out at this point in time that you'll notice that that letter A did go through the grid, through the floor that I created. There is no collision uh, insurance or uh, way to stop this collision. Ah, okay. So meaning that all objects can pass through each other. I'll get to the question in just a moment. Let me just finish this thought. As one person explained it online, which I stole, is think about your moving ghosts around on the screen. All the objects can go through each other. And I'm going to hit undo, 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 there we go. Back to my starting point. The reason why, once again, yes, the reason why this is not a flat line and you can see the grid is of course the angle of the camera is everything. For example, if I were to, again, on the left-hand side, change this to front, 
There it is, straight on. The camera's up a little, just a hair. And that's why the default active camera just is, knowing that this sort of things happen. But the custom 3D view allows me to see things even better. Now, one other thing I want to point out about moving things around, and this will become very important for you and helpful for you down the road. So this is, if you're taking notes, this is one you definitely want, which is if you use the little, thank you, Adobe After Effects for doing an autosave in the middle of the class. Yeah, go away, bye-bye. Um, is the whirly gig here, the red, green? Let me zoom in, move around, there it is. There they are, there's the little triangles. When I put my mouse on top of this, you'll notice that, yes indeed, when I, my mouse is on one of the triangles here, which you can see is actually more like a diamond, you do get the Z, the X, and eventually you'll get the Y as well. When you have any one of these arrows and you hold down the shift key, the object will move forward and backwards without changing any other angle. So when I move the Z, it goes forward and backwards, like so, but it will not move in the X and Y positions. Same is true with the X, et cetera. Unlike if I grab this manually, just grab the letter A, I have really tough controls. I can't really tell about where I'm placing it. You know, am I high, am I low? That's why you need two views to be able to tell whether or not you're, you know, like even at both these angles, you can't tell from a few pixels through that, you know, the A is through a few pixels down below or if it's not. So you wanna be a little bit, con you know, careful moving things around. So moving things via the little arrows here, just make sure that you have a nice smooth animation and stuff. Speaking of animation, that is one of the things that you can do with this, just like you would do anything else. So say I want my letter A to move around this, the grid. I can just hit the position keyframe, slide over a few seconds. Oops, if I lock you down, you silly grid. Oh, I unlocked it, yeah, my bad. That's why you wanna lock these things down from time to time to prevent you grabbing more than one thing. Move around, move another few seconds here. And because I didn't hold down the shift, I accidentally went down. For another few seconds. And so my animation. And remember the right hand side is the camera. This is what the audience is going to see, not what's over on the left hand side here. Now this is normally in the class, just to let you know. And when you come to practice this, this is a good point to practice. This is also where I you know, tell people to go crazy with their keyframes. So for example, you could do a Y rotation. So the silly thing rotates five times where it's moving. We so you also notice when it comes to the little guy, you know, it goes right through him. Again, think of moving ghosts around. Etc. Okay. Okay, questions from the audience. This is a good place to do that sort of thing. I see Jeffrey always has one, which is can you make the active camera move or does it only sense? Okay, the answer to the question is, <laughs> this is one of those things of technically speaking, technically speaking, the active camera never moves. Okay, so, however, 
we can create a different camera and we'll be doing that in a few more minutes, which can move. So you can actually make a camera that looks like the custom view on the left-hand side. But give me a second, I wanna talk about a few more things before we get to doing this sort of thing. Okay, Genevieve, I do not know why your background is disappearing. I would suggest that maybe the background and the objects are too close to each other. Like I'm saying, the biggest problem with dealing with 3D when you first start do dealing with it is you lose track of how close or far away they, things are. You can move a object or a letter behind each other in Z space and you totally lose track of where things are located. Okay. So we'll come back to that in just a second. Now, the next thing I'm going to do at this point is I actually have a six second video, which is this animal safari. So I'm going to come in and drop it into my comp. Hmm. I'll think on that, Jevin and Vive. I don't know why it shows up in the first frame, but not the other ones. Keep in mind, you gotta make sure that it's also long enough in the timeline as a clip. But bear with me for just a second here as I change subjects. Okay, first things first. I have now a 2D layer. Notice that this 2D layer is visible from my active camera, but not visible by my, in my custom view. Okay, the situation is this gets back into what I was saying earlier. Do not mix a 2D layer and 3D layers because this is where you're going to go absolutely nuts. Mainly because this layer has absolutely no Z space. Okay, so it doesn't know how to interact with this custom space. If I move this down, you know, I can move it under the layers, but it still becomes an issue. Okay, there are good reasons and bad reasons to mix these uh, layers together as 2D and 3D. But like I said, until you get used to this, it will drive you absolutely nuts. Now watch what happens the moment I hit the little blank area below my cube. Yep, I'm about to do that. I'm about to show you how to make this a 3D layer. All you have to do is click, bang. It is now a, literally in the 3D layer. Even though it's only a you know 2D video. Now the neat thing about this, of course, is I can also scale this up, move it around, and maybe a little bit bigger. There we go. Okay. So if you look at my video clip now, I've moved it all the way to the back of the grid. And basically it's like a back wall. Now when I hit play, just to demonstrate, you can see that my letter A is still spinning, still moving around, and you can see the video playing as well. So what does this all look like from different angles? Now going back to the left-hand side again, if I switch this from custom view to left view, you can see that there's my very large video. There's the two layers that make up the grid. There's my little man and there's my letter A. And because it's rotated, it's actually facing the left view. It has to be, if I move it here. See how it's almost only one pixels from the camera view, but it's right on here. If I view this from the top, I can see the motion path of my letter A because I have the letter A layer sele selected. If I click my uh, animal safari there, and that's where how far back it is and stuff. And again, I could just click on each one of these things. And if I click on either layer of my grid, you can see that there's my giant, I really made this huge in size, etc. But as you can see, this is doing something radically different from almost every other piece of software that you will be using. This, you cannot do this in Premiere, you cannot do this in Photoshop or anything else. Okay, this is where we're getting into making After Effects really super different. Now, yes, you can, by the way, you can import 3D objects 
okay, into uh, After Effects. We're not covering that tonight. Okay, so bear with me. I'm trying to get just the bare bones. We have a lot to cover tonight, and there's got some bare bones basics to cover as well. Okay, so so before I go on, any questions so far? What do you guys think? Okay, everybody happy with the pace so far? Not too fast, not too slow. Where's the 2D letter file? The 2D letter is a literally a regular text file. Ta-da, right there. Just something I made in After Effects. Um, I'll have to check the file I uploaded. It was made as part of the comp. I think I may have deleted the comp from the zip file. My apologies for doing that. But basically all you have to do to make a letter is letter T, come over to the working space. Of course, hit stop, letter B. Of course, you gotta you got make that 3D. Change the color of that and let's make that a And voila, I now have a letter B in the middle of my screen. Gina says, so all 2D objects and files will be turned into 3D layers by clicking on the 3D box icon. Yep, that is 100% correct. That's how we convert this stuff from 2D to 3D. And re again, remember these are layers Okay, just trying to be precise on that one. No, uh, the question came up, we can't put in 3D objects? Nope, that's not what I said. I said, I'm not doing that tonight because that's a different conversation. Okay, that adds a level of complexity. I'm trying to keep this as straight as, as streamlined as possible, not to worry. By the way, there's a tremendous amount you can do in just with simple 2D objects, 2D objects, okay? And I'll be demonstrating that uh, next week. Where's the 3D on button? Hmm, not good, not paying attention. Right there. This means, the seeing the little cube means it's on, a blank setting means it's off, okay? I think I just accidentally, oops, I did. Yep, just reset my background by mistake. Okay. All right. Now, yeah, one of the funnier, I do have to tell a little story here, by the way. One of the funnier uh, things, that, you know, because teachers often talk to each other. You know, if you think about it, what we're only about, uh, this is only the sixth class, and we're only talking 3D. I've talked to other teachers, and they, I tell them, yeah, I normally get into 3D around you know, week five, you know, five or six, and they like stare at me going, that's so confusing, that's so hard, you don't wanna do that, and I'm like, mm, no, it's not. As a matter of fact, knowing that this exists and knowing that this is you know, available to you is tremendous. By the way, I do want to point out one important thing also you do not have to do 3D for your projects unless I specify them, okay? Just want to say that. So you might want to remember that. I've told you this, okay? So Genevieve says, how do I get an image to show up for more than two frames? It's only following up. If it's a regular text file or an image itself, like this, the little guy here, just grab the edge and stretch it out. If it's your actual composition, then you're going to want to go into your comp settings and make sure your duration is longer than two frames and stuff. Okay. As for importing thing in the length, my memory serves me, it's hiding under preferences and stuff. You should be able to grab it and uh, 
you should be able to grab it and stretch it out. Under preferences, importing, length of composition, or you can set it here to a specific length. You want to be careful because right now, for example, this is set to only one second. Okay. So you might have that set down to a couple, uh, to just like a few frames. So double check those settings as well. Can you create a 3D comp and drop it into D, 2D comp? Indeed you can. Okay, Jonathan. And I should point out, I'm, that's gonna be a major topic for next week's class. Next week's class, just as a preview, we're going to actually make some 3D objects in the class. Okay, tonight's the overview and then next week we're going to actually start making stuff. Alrighty, so just keep that in mind, that is coming. So let's get through this basic stuff. So far, so good. Okay, I'm going to do a few more things and then we will take a short break for you guys, okay? So bear with me for a second. All right, so we do indeed have our layers. And the reason why B and A are in the order they're in is just simply because of the Z space. B is not moving. I can have A in front of B, like so, even though they're in different positions down on the timeline. 3D, again, I'm going to repeat myself. In 2D, the top layer gets priority. In 3D space with the little cubes, you end up with what Z space will always have a higher priority. Okay. So what can we do with all this fun stuff? I'm actually going to take my letter B and I'm going to move him off to the side. I move him off camera. Okay. Now this is what I'm about to show you is where the cool stuff really starts coming in. We've talked that there's many different types of layers that you can use with After Effects, okay? I'm going to go into something that's reasonably advanced, but I think you guys can handle it, which is I'm going to add a new layer to this scene that I've created. I'm going to go up to Layer, New, and I'm going to create a thing called a light. Now, this is a light just like it would be on a stage. Okay, meaning I'm creating a spotlight. There's actually several different types. Point light is a small version of spotlight. Ambient means light everywhere and parallel, parallel spot is different. Spotlight's precisely what we want to do right now. I can also change the color of the light. I want to leave it white. And like spotlights, I can control the intensity of the bulb and the cone angle and things like this. I want to leave most of these settings alone. What's important right here is one thing is this cast shadows. Now casting shadows, people immediately assume, and I want everyone paying attention to what I'm about to say, the casting shadows is a two-step process. You've got to do two things to create shadows. Step one is actually clicking this box. You'll notice down here it says shadows are only cast from layers when cast shadows are also enabled on the layer itself. That's step number two. So cast shadows, and then we'll do step two in just a moment. So once I hit this, notice how things change. In my custom view, this is my spotlight with again, one of these whirly gigs. As I pull my light out, you'll notice that, I'm not getting much of light there actually. Let's, if I pull my light up, so I can move my light left, right, forward, backwards, and pull it up. And then also there's a new thing on this light, which is this line straight ahead. This is called the point of interest. And this is where the light is actually pointed. So think about these arrows as putting a light up, down, right, left. I'm hanging it up on a pole. And this is how I point my light. Now, when you're first dealing with lights, by the way, just a heads up, this light 
if you turn it too far the wrong way, it's no longer pointing at your objects, meaning that you're getting no light. <laughs> Some people rotate their lights to 180 to the point of which it's like, hey, I can't see anything. Okay, I'll get back to you in just a moment, Genevieve. And okay, so there's my light. Now on my layers, I have my light options plus my transform. Notice that I have all the position con control so I can move my light forward, backwards, right, left, up, down, etc. Now when I move it though, notice that my point of interest is static because it has its own set. And yes, you can animate this. So there's my light pointed directly at my letter A. But notice that my letter A does not have a shadow. That's because I have to now tell that layer that I want a shadow. Now, obviously underneath my layer, I have the text options, which is the actual text, fonts, et cetera. I have all the transform for the layer itself. I also have the geometric properties, which is not, is grayed out right at the moment. So bear with me on that one. Basically this allows me to make 3D text and stuff. It's grayed out because we have to do other things to make that happen. Finally, though, the other new option that shows up is material options. Uh, before I go any further, by the way, the, these bottom two geometry options and material options do not show up unless it's a 3D layer. These two things will only show up when it's a 3D layer. Under material options are various options to create the texture. Now, I'm not going to show you how to like make metallic stuff, metallic letters versus cloth le letters and things like this. That's a little bit more we want, we want to get into tonight. We're trying to stick with the 3D stuff for the evening. But this is where the cast shadows. If the light is set to, the, to cast shadows and the layer is set to cast shadows, both of these two things have to happen. Then you'll get a shadow. If they're not, well, then there is no shadow, but now, okay, let's look at that. There is my letter A shadow. And as, oops, there we go. And as I move manually move it through, you can see there's my letter A and stuff. Earlier on, you should have noticed that that shadow also hit that back wall of my video and proceeded to bend. I want you to think for a moment of the math that's going on for After Effects. That it has to calculate the angle of the shadow, the angle of the light, the angle of the shape, and also all the angles of everything that's going to hit. So now when I hit play, And you can see how it moves in and out of the light. Okay, now let me stop while I answer a few questions. The answer, let's say I'm going to sorry to do this uh, backwards is from the first one is, yes, the spotlight has many settings. And by the way, you can always go back up to layer, bring up the big toolbox, but this is where you can change the intensity. As a matter of fact, you can make it brighter than 100% if you want to and the angles and things like that. That's also where down below here, the exact same information is located down under the lighting options. Okay, now remember to do a shadow, two things have to happen. One is under light settings, either through the timeline or down below, you must hit cast shadows here. And then each layer, and I want to emphasize this, each layer under material options, you also must turn on cast shadows as well. 
Okay, those are the two key things to get yourselves a nice shadow going. And yes, all these options are key frameable. So I can create a lighting change and a animation at the same time. So for example, I can now, you know, as I look at this, I can sit there and go, well, I don't like that light. I want to pull it out. Because obviously the farther I pull light out away from the scene, the bigger the area it's going to cover. So I get more light on my scene. But you'll notice, of course, and the reason why my little man's there is that there is no shadow for that little man. For me to be able to give him a shadow, I have to go down, open up go material options, tell it to cast a shadow. And now my little man does have a shadow. Now, the, again, I want to emphasize the render time on doing this is something very big, okay? When you start adding in the sort of materials, you are going to eat up a lot of your computer processing power, okay? So if you think you can do After Effects and surf the web and listen to music, have Pandora open, YouTube, and do chat and stuff at the same time, um, yeah, you're gonna run into some problems. So I just want to give you that heads up. And stuff, you know, Max says, you know, my respect for Adobe for this. It's like, yeah, mine too. Think about this for a split second. We're doing this on home computers, for goodness sakes. We're going to do something this event. And this right now is extraordinarily simple. Wait until you see what we're going to do in a couple weeks. Okay. <laughs> this is like, <sighs> but you can see why After Effects is one of those pieces of software that I just love. You've heard me say this in class already, but you know, if you can think of it, you can do it in After Effects, providing you got the time and energy, okay? Am I going to need a better computer in a couple of weeks? No, you can probably uh, use your computers you currently have, just expect to slow down. And also doing all this lighting and other things I'm showing you tonight are not required for your projects, okay? But this is the point of the class where one of the other reasons I'm showing this to you is once you've seen this, you guys sit there and go, yeah, this is something you want to learn. This is like, wow, powerful and stuff. You know, it's really amazingly cool. Okay, getting back to zero, zero, zero on my timeline. Okay, one more thing and then we'll take the break. Okay, so lighting is made up of obviously the position of where the light's located and this thing called the point of interest, we, which literally is where is that light pointed? Is it pointed to the right side of the stage, left side of the stage, whatever? Okay. The question that was asked much earlier is, what if I don't want to use this active camera? Can I move this camera and make it look like this angle? Again, this is where we're splitting hairs. The active camera never moves. However, ha ha ha, tricky thing here. Under layer new, you'll notice that there is an option here for camera. Basically, by creating another camera separate from, and this is another important thing to keep in mind, it is separate from the active camera, okay? This camera is literally a camera. It starts off, okay, so just in case you guys weren't looking, layer, new, camera, we you can give your camera a name and it has all the normal lens settings and everything else. Plus it has a drop down menu for the standard 35 millimeter lenses, wide lens angle, telephotos and things like this. Okay. I am not going to get into this tonight. Okay. Any of these custom pre-built settings are perfectly good. I'm going to actually set mine to 35 millimeter, but notice that you can change the depth of field and do all sorts of crazy things. I've had, camera for professionals look at this one screen and just go, oh my goodness gracious. You know, it is like everything in, you know, that you would ever want out of a camera. Okay, so I'm just going to use the 35 millimeter lens, hit okay. And I'm going to use the drop down menu to change this from my right hand side from the active camera 
to my camera number one? And the answer is yes, this is a lot like Maya. And it's because, and this has been around a lot longer than Maya. So guess who stole what idea from what? One of the things I should have said earlier on, by the way, is if you learn this 3D software here, it will help you when you move on to Maya or any other 3D programs. Because a lot of the basic concepts of 3D come from After Effects and other software uses them, including the crazy, you know, whirly gigs of moving the things around, et cetera. So let me click on my camera layer and let me move things around so you guys can actually see things. As a matter of fact, I actually think I'm going to flip it back to one view. Ooh, I want to see things on that custom view. There we go. Okay, there is my camera. It is a symbol representative of, you know, a film camera and it has its own, again, whirly gig. It has a pyramid shape pointed at where it's pointed. And then again, they have a point of interest, which allows me to pan and tilt camera. As a matter of fact, I guess I'm going to go back to the two views. Right hand side will be my camera one. Back over to here. Click on my camera. So with my point of interest pointed, you can see I can pan and tilt this. Now, when it comes to using a camera, you have to think of several different things. Ah, yes, good question just came up. Let me stop here with saying, by changing the camera one to, from to camera one from active camera, that's what's going to be exported. The answer is, yep, that's what the, the audience is going to see. Okay, the triangles on the camera itself are the position. We come down here, transform, position. Think of this as your tripod. Is your tripod forward, back from the scene, to the right, to the left, up or down? If you think of a tripod, and I don't know how much experience you guys have had with that, that is basic movement. You're literally picking up the tripod, moving it around. But tripod also has a thing, a ball joint on it, which is called the head. Okay. The head is literally that. It's a ball that the camera sits on. <laughs> Max just uh, asked the question, wait, you can animate the camera movements? Yeah, you can. Isn't that cool? Plus you can just animate the pan and tilting. You know, this is basically where you're literally pointed, you know, point of interest. The name says it all. Where is the camera pointed? Is it pointed to the right side, left side, up, down, right, left? So for example, if I move the tripod, but do not move the point of interest. Okay. Now, actually, let me take a step back here. I should point out something. Okay, by grabbing the little triangles here, and this is really important, the point of interest moves with the entire camera. Whee! Yes, I can fly that camera straight through that opening in the letter A if I line everything up correctly. Um, <coughs> so if by grabbing the red one, I can move the camera to the right and to the left. Now notice that my point of interest is always still pointed the exact same way. However, if I grab my camera without grabbing the little triangles, and how do I know that? Is literally when I grab the triangle, I see a little X, Y, or Z, depending upon which one I grab. Now, if I just grab my camera and start moving it, notice that my point of interest does not move. I can literally fly this camera, and I could animate it to fly all the way around the shape. So, going down to my timeline. The point of interest is where the camera's pointed. If it stays static, meaning that it doesn't move at all, then the camera will always point at the same pixels. If I move the, excuse me, not the rotation, but you can, yes, you can rotate your camera too if you want to make people get motion sickness. Uh, but position, the X, Y, Z, is moving the tripod around. So let me just do a very simple 
animation here. Okay. No, I am not expecting you to do any of this for the Food Network title next sequence. Okay, don't, don't you know, unless you have a lot of time on your hands and you might, after all. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not, the, what we're doing is pretty darn advanced. And like I said, other teachers freak out when I tell them how early I do this in the semester. Okay, but remember the next couple of classes is we're going to, this week is just giving you this basic, basic information. Next week, we're going to start building things in After Effects, you know, 3D objects and whatnot. And then the week after that, we're going to put it all together and actually make a virtual set. We're going to take 2D objects and we're going to make a sequence that will look 3D to the audience. Okay, so that's what you have to look forward to over the next few weeks. But let me just do a simple animation and show you the difference. Okay, again, if I grab the little red triangle, I'm just going to move my camera off camera and say keyframe the point of interest and, and position. Go to the end of my two seconds. Grab my red thing. Move it to the right. Voila. So notice that the, my motion path for the point of interest and the camera are literally a slide from the left side to the right side. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Click on the viewer of the camera that would make life a lot easier. There we go. We Again, think of the processing time. And it's doing it, you know, in a few split seconds here. So that is one way of doing that. Now I'm going to clear those keyframes, just by turning off the stoplights and bring my camera back. Okay. Now I'm going to actually do these in two separate motions. I'm going to take my camera, move it up. Okay, so I'm just going to now keyframe my position and then I'm going to have it So you can see my position is not moving at all. It's still always looking at the same pixels. My camera is doing this wide swing. Now watch what happens when I render this. Again, click on the other side, because you want to see the cam camera view, not the custom view. Again, this is what the audience is going to see. No, Max, you can't preview the composition of both views. I'm never sure if this, the, uh, you know, I think it's, that's done intentionally because God, I don't even want to think of the processing power, you know, the computers that would need. I assume eventually in some upgrade, they will have that as an option, but at this point in time, you can't. So what do you guys think? Interesting stuff, right? I mean, this is pretty advanced. I should point out, I could add multiple lights to create different shadows going in different direction, colored lights, et cetera, et cetera, as well. But this is a pretty powerful few options. <laughs> yeah, I cover a lot of, Max has just said, this was beyond what I thought the class was going to cover. Yeah. I cover a lot of information in my class. You know, I either scare everyone off or I, <laughs> everyone goes, yeah, let's do it. Let's really learn how to use this piece of software. Okay. So hopefully you guys are not being scared off by this. Hopefully this is making some sense. Because if you think about it, we've just added one more thing to what we've already covered in class. I'm still doing the exact same keyframes, the exact same animations that we were doing in 2D. The only difference now is I have to now start thinking about forward and backwards, Z space. Beyond that, everything else is, you know, it's the same. I mean, this, the, notice that I only use two keyframes for this entire part. That's it. Nothing fancier than two keyframes to get myself looking here. 
Yeah, and obviously the keyframes to move the letter A around, but et cetera. And also if I don't like the look of the lighting or the shadowing, I just have to go back to my spotlight and go, okay, maybe I need to pull it out a little bit more. Point it down or up or whichever way I want to make it look. Et cetera. And I can But you can see how this really brings a movie to life. I mean, even if it's simple 2D letter A dancing around, that's, you know, not too bad. Okay, guys, let's take some questions real fast and then we'll take a break. Can you show us an example of 3D layers or use a professional setting? Sphere field and then sense. Yeah, we're going to do that. Like I said, this is why this is going to take a couple of uh, nights to cover. Yeah, you know, because this is not obviously, you know, the simplest thing on the planet. Like I said, I believe some uh, teachers don't even cover 3D for the beginning class. But I think it'd be a shame not to cover it in class. Because this is just like too cool for words. And it's also a good indication of why we should do things. So I will be doing some, we'll be doing some more things after the break. Okay, everybody else, anybody else have any questions or anything? Or did I just bring your, bring your brains out and stuff? Okay, I'm going to, okay, it's almost quarter of, <laughs> love this lesson. Yeah, I'm sorry I have no handouts for this one because it's just too generic. I can't, I never did figure out how to get that down to a page or two. But next week we will have handouts and stuff. Okay, I'm going to pause the video. Uh, pause recording. Okay, everybody, we're going to get started in just a minute. Any questions or anything for me before we begin? I realize I just dumped a ton of information on you and stuff. Also, before we begin, I just, uh, <laughs> this is a more personal note here. Uh, I, actually, this morning I went out to the Red Cross and donated blood. If you are able to do so, I would uh, encourage you to go to the uh, Red Cross website and see, find the nearest blood drive near you, um, redcross.org, and sign up for it. Um, it was, they actually have a new streamlined process where you can actually answer all those crazy questions and stuff before you get there. And I found it really uh, straightforward and fast and stuff, and it will really help save lives. If you can donate some blood, um, during the current craziness that we're going through, the the virus in our, you know, so hope you're all staying healthy and safe too. Okay, I have eight o'clock up on my clock and stuff. Okay, I'd like everybody now to go ahead and hit, sit, type in a little hello here, present something onto your chat screens if you have that up. If not, go ahead and open up the chat screen again. 
because I'm here, here, here. Yeah, thank you all, one and all. The videos, uh, actually the video recording system does record those things. I never left, okay. You have a stronger bladder than I do, the Max. Um, and stuff. I'd like to also remind you that project number two, the Food Network uh, title sequence is uh, due next week. So I expect to see that also. I'm also just by the way thinking of uh, setting up basically office hours in a day or two or something like that so people can chat with me one on one. I've uh, basically just learned how to do that in the uh, Zoom software. So I will send out a class uh, note to everybody. I'm not sure when I'm going to do that because I've been, like I said, today it was just way too busy. Uh, uh, two things I was the two things I did besides prepping for the class today was uh, you know donating blood and also I went to the grocery store and uh, bought a lot of the uh, groceries just not for myself but also for my neighbors and my uh, parents then ran around and delivered those and left on the doorstep and stuff so just uh, keeping myself busy and I hope you guys are too and having time to work on your projects. Okay, uh, I think that's enough time. It looks like everybody's here. All right, now one of the things about dealing with the cameras and stuff is we're actually doing a throwback to a much older concept. Originally 2D animation back, you know, we're talking about hand-drawn days. Uh, the situation was such that, um, you know, they just literally had the ca cartoon characters and whatnot run across the screen. I've got a little video that I'm going to show real fast now because I don't want to get copyright violations. I'm going to pause it because Disney came up with a system called multiplaning. And that's more or less what we're going to be doing in the After Effects system, even though it's not uh, the exact same thing. It's a good little video. Anyhow, so when we move our camera around, we have to think about that moving closer and farther away. Now I'm going to make another new comp. Okay, and I have a folder called farm and I'm going to grab all the objects and drag them down here. And I'm going to make all the layers 3D. And with the grass, I'm, it's going to be my base. I'm going to sit here and rotate it. Once again, 90 degrees. I'm going to bring that down. And then I'm going to lock that into place. Now my other objects here, I can move around. Now all these things are different scales, which doesn't really matter to me. Why? Because actually I'm going to place it forward and back. So some objects should be in the background. I don't like that green glass lens. So some small things should be farther away. I can also scale them up to compensate if I think they're too small. I grab my mower here. Oh, slide him off the camera. So I've got my tractor. And I gotta see. Now when you're doing this sort of thing, you're going to sit here and go, okay, I'm going to put my tractor down, but is it inside the grass or not? How can I tell? This angle doesn't help me. However, I can look at the, say the, you know, left-hand side and I can see that, yeah, my image is a little bit in there. It also depends a lot about how I want to Photoshop it. And having it a little bit in with the wheels may not be a bad thing. Farmhouse may be too big, so let's shrink it down because it should be the background. So I can just sit there with my things. And keep in mind, you can still animate these things just like you would anything else.
Chunka, 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 chunka. So when you're setting these, um, your shapes up, you know, you have to make a decision how forward and backwards and stuff. Do you want to make these things and do you want them to collide or not collide? But this is basically the exact same thing that I was doing with my letter A's and stuff. I'm just using different Now also when you do things with photographs and stuff, this guy is at literally the wrong angle. Notice, of course, that his feet are off the ground. This is a bad photograph to use in this situation. And that's one of the reasons why I like actually to include it is to show that choosing the right image can really make a difference. Now then I often get people who say, well, wait, Eric, I can just rotate him. But here's the problem. All these objects are literally, you know, one pixel thick. Therefore, rotating these things is not going to be helpful all that much. And if I sit there and go, can't bring him down. You know, so this guy is never going to be incorporated very well with the image. It just doesn't work, unlike, say, my tractor, which goes, is at a 90 degree angle to my active camera, just as the rest of these are. They're fine. I can see the difference. Or I can say they actually fit into the scene a lot better than everything else. So you do want to be, you know, conscious of what images you're going to put in. I know that's a very simple thing, but it's a little fun thing to play with. This again is one of those points in the class I would just say, you know, go for it and have you guys goof off with these images and stuff. Okay, another thing, one file I have is called clouds. This is where we're going to get into that depth of field parallaxing that you saw in the multiplane hammer animation. Again, another new composition. Let's call one. And I have a series of clouds. I'm going to pick one of these. I'm going to choose this one, 530. And I'm going to make this my background. Now, when I say that, I'm, of course, going to make it 3D first. Now, the problem with this is, as you can see, it doesn't fill the screen. And also, I want to move back. So when I go into my transform, I'm going to want to change the position back. And I want to choose an even number. This is going to be my back wall of my stage. So I'm going to move this back 5,000 pixels. Yeah, it may be too much. 1,000 pixels. There we go. And then I'm going to scale this way up. Whee! So it actually fills the entire screen. Again, my active camera here. This is what my audience is going to see. Now I'm going to make the illusion of flying through the clouds by using a combination of these other uh, images. So I'm going to grab this other cloud image, number 1969, good year. Again, make it 3D so they show up. I'm going to scale this forward. Now, this is obviously at the zero point because that's when I drag and drop it down. And the other one is at uh, 1,000 pixels back. As I sit here, I go, I don't want all this extra stuff. I just want a fluffy cloud. Now I'm going to grab my pin tool. We're going to make a mask like we have in other classes. And I'm just going to grab, make a random shape here, close it. Now it's going to hit the letter F for feathering. So my little fluffy cloud looks like a little fluffy cloud. Now with that little cloud, I can move it any way I want. I can move it forward, backwards into my 3D space. I can also adjust it distort it. I can make it, it's moving my mass, not my shape. There we go. Whoa. 
I'll grab both layers there, okay. Like so. Once I have it positioned where I want it, I can of course duplicate it, put it somewhere else in 3D space, change its shape. I can even get a little bit of rotation so it doesn't look like exactly the same thing. Again, moving it forward and backwards. I'm now going to grab a different cloud. That one. Make it 3D. Make the layer 3D. Transform. Scale it up a bit. Once again, I'm going to grab my pen tool. Give this a weird shape. Choose feathering the edges. Again, just to make it soft around there. Pull it way forward and duplicate that. Push it back. Move it off to the right hand, left hand side, move it up. Let's put a little rotation on that as well. We'll see why I'm doing this in just a second. So I, as you can see from my custom view, I've got these all, all over the place, which is good and fine. Now I'm going to add a camera. So I go layer, new, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Once again, select everything. Layer, new, there we go, camera. I'm going to stick with the 35 millimeter lens and move it back. Now, as you can see, as I move the camera around, I'm getting this weird, neat result. Ah, question was keyboard shortcut for duplication. Command, well, I'm on Windows machine right now, so Command D. Okay, or Apple D. Okay, Control D. Anyhow, so there's my camera moving forward and backwards. Now, if I pull the camera too far back, you can see my problem of I can see the edges, which normally gets back into the original background. Pull that to the very bottom. That is my background. This is where renaming layers. Background is very handy. And I'm going to scale that back up again. I could grab it manually and do it, but I'm just going to do it like that. And actually, I think pushing it back again to 2,000 pixels and have to make it bigger again. There we go. Scale it back up again. Now, because clouds are nice and fluffy, flying through them is normal. It really doesn't. So I'm just going to keyframe the positions. Go up again. And I'm just going to Yeah, be careful here. If you move too far forward and you hit 2,000 th pixels, you know I have gone through the, my background. So with using doing that, backing it up now, I can see my animation. I accidentally have things. Yep. That's right. I'm, Basically, I moved it back and I was still activating my keyframes. So, I'm going to I'm just going to move the camera forward and backwards, not worrying about the point of interest. I've increased the point of interest to 2,000 pixels. And yes, I can see the edge. So, give me a second here to fix that. There we go. Yeah, and I'm just going to move the camera forward. And just stop short of hitting the background. So now when we fly through the clouds, you can see now at this point, of course, 
these these particular clouds are no longer in view. My little triangle is beyond them, or the pyramid shape of what I can see. So I can add another one, include that one. Rotate there. So as we fly through the clouds, because the camera is viewing things from different depths of field, it gives you that sense of motion. This is known as what the multiplane camera does. And it's also a term officially is known as parallaxing. When objects move, depending upon their distance, it looks like they move at different speeds. If you drive out in the middle of say, take the five freeway all the way up to San Francisco from LA, you'll hit that flat farmland area where there's mountains in the far side and posts near you. It looks like they're flying by. You're still driving by at the same speed, but because those objects are closer to you, it looks like they're going faster, just as these clouds look like they're going faster as we go. And it gives us that nifty sense of parallaxing views. And as we build the scene, we can sit there and just sit there and go, what do we want to do? Move things out a little bit more, gives us more. Yeah, there we go. Now that's, something's happening there. At which point, of course, we can then add in for doing, and yes, for those of you sharp-eyed people, this is how you do your Harry Potter uh, title sequences. Okay. I need that too big. It's okay. Shrink it down. Now my again, this is two D. Therefore, it doesn't mix well. We're making that three D. And that the worst color to choose. Remember, I was talking about text two weeks ago got to have contrast. Okay, so make that red text. And I have to decide where, how far back do I want to put that? And how do I want it to reveal to the audience? And stuff. And depending upon what I want to, you know, have text wise, actually, I might have changed that. You know, again, it gets into what do I want this to really look like? And there's nothing wrong with, that was kind of funky at reveal. That popped a little too much. Okay, you can see it goes through that one image blocking it, then all of a sudden it's not. And that's too a little sharp. Now, which cloud is causing that? Ah, how do you troubleshoot this stuff? Well, you go over to the little eyeballs here. And I now know that it's layer number four that's causing that thing to pop the way it is. So I have to make a decision. How do I want that? Yeah, there's the, you can see it moving there. You know, sometimes you want it that way, sometimes you don't. It really does get into that weirdness of, what do you want it to look like? And when you look at these things, by the way, you can change the view, go from custom view, to left side view, and you can see the distance of all these objects. And you can actually watch your camera roll through this. And you can see, so there's my text. I can actually move my text even further back. But remember, the moment I move this past the 
2000 pixel li limit. Whee! It's now hiding behind my background. That's the one thing you want to avoid. <laughs> Things like that. And that's as far as I go. That's the last keyframe. I could move things closer, but I'm not sure I want to. But I can also take that same text layer. Duplicate. Bring that way forward. And I can start putting together an actual title sequence here. Now, what do I want this to be? I'll make that up higher. I'm going to use the other one. I'm going to put that actually maybe over here. Go down. With the text in there, you can actually see the different depth of field of the parallaxing that I was talking about. See how it looks like everything's moving at a different speed. You know, as it gets closer to the camera, it seems to be moving faster compared to the background. So these files are in the folder, the zip file I put in Canvas. I strongly recommend that you download them and make yourself a little comp and just play with them. Just start playing with the 3D process. If we were in per class, in person in class, this is what we'd be doing right now anyhow, is letting you experiment, playing with it, having a good time. Because there's a lot of fun things you can do with this. And in answer to the normal questions I get at this point, uh, you can, of course, play with the lighting and do all sorts of other fun stuff, et cetera. But this left-hand view that you see here, which is actually a top, you know, more or less a top view, you can see how I positioned all the various little cloud bits to go flying through my shapes. And you can sit there and watch the camera move slowly through each one of those things. When you look at this left-hand side of my uh, viewing screen, if you look down, I want you to think back into uh, your childhood. I don't know if you guys ever did this, but this is one of the things I did in, when I was a kid, you know, young kid, was they would always have us bring in a shoebox and we would rotate the thing 90 degrees and then we put shapes and objects into it and we create what was referred to as a diorama. If you think about building, you know, these shapes, this is your diorama, this is your back, ground of your box. And these are all the little shapes in there. The only difference is we're taking a camera and flying it around inside the uh, diorama. Yeah. Which again, it gives you the really cool look and feels and stuff. And it's up to you how you want to position these things, put things into your little box. Now again, I want to emphasize one thing that's really important it takes a little while getting your head around is there's a huge difference between viewing what the audience is seeing and seeing what, you know, stepping away from the camera and, you know, seeing the outside of the shape. Unfortunately, a lot of people spend, you know, like set up the custom view, rearrange everything that looks okay this way. But when they render it out, they go, oh, wait, nothing looks like it lines up. You know, we got to sit there and actually play with this as we're going, okay? You can't ever forget about what the camera's seeing versus what you're seeing. That's a fundamental thing to get used to when playing with the 3D tools, not just in After Effects, but in all 3D programs, okay? So this is a good place to take questions, guys. What are you guys thinking of this? You guys starting to see some possibilities and whatnot?
You guys are being so quiet. You're scaring me. <laughs> you guys all have all run around, run away and have um, watching things on YouTube. No, I'm just teasing you. Okay. So again, I want to emphasize, you do not have to use any of this 3D stuff when, we, uh, when you start using your projects. I'll tell you if it's necessary for a project. You can do really good creative projects without all this 3D stuff. But in my opinion, it's important to know that this is an option. For example, when you're doing titlings, let me just go in here, make a new compound. Title. We are going to go ahead and type in. that a little bit smaller. Okay, so let me just try that now. Okay, so that's 2D. Let me add a background to that. So I'm just going to use a simple layer, new, solid. Let's make this a aqua, yeah, light blue. And put that underneath. There we go, there's some good contrast. So that's the title sequence. So far, so good. Let's make this 3D. Okay. Now I'm also now going to add light to this. Go Layer, new light. Spotlight's fine, cast shadow's good, etc. Now by simply adding the spotlight, you can already see that looks radically different. Let's see. A little too bright. You remember what I did last time. Let's make it just make it. Now, first things first, no shadows. Remember, gotta go welcome material options, cast shadow. And then the next question everyone says is, wait, I'm not seeing a shadow there, Eric. Aha. That's because the blue background and the lettering are still touching each other. If I look at the left-hand side again, see, there is nothing there. But, well, let's grab that lettering. If I pull this out a little bit, go back to my back to the camera, aha, there's my shadowing. Now you can do drop shadowing the traditional way, but let's face it, That's a whole different type of drop shadow. That's the real McCoy. And also, if you move the light, you get that cool effect. Again, all done. You gotta admit, that's vastly different than the more traditional you know, Photoshop method of layer styles to create a drop shadow and stuff. Very, you know. And we could even take it a step further. Like if we were to rotate, which way do I want to rotate this, our background? You can see the difference between the left and right hand side there. And yeah, I could put in a camera, of course, and have all sorts of fun with that. So many possibilities. With that method, I think I will animate that light. Again, simple position, keyframe, that's all you gotta do. No, not orientation. Let's not go there. Not tonight. And now, and I forgot, I didn't make a keyframe. Silly of me. See, even teachers get to make mistakes sometimes. Let's put it right here. Get 
There we go. That's what we want. Hmm. Across. There we go. That would make a good horror film introduction, don't you think? Of course, rather than spelling welcome, maybe we should spell it. Oh yeah, that's much more creepy, don't you think? <laughs> but you can see by just rotating things and playing with it a bit, I could make those, I'm sure you've all seen those super long shadow title sequences and stuff where the, the shadow is you know, going out and coming toward the camera, away from the camera. All I would have to do is, you know, have a flat um, background for the shadow to rest on and then move the light to where I want it to be and stuff. So lots of possibilities there. Okay, guys. Questions, thoughts, ideas, suggestions. Or have I overwhelmed you already at this point? <laughs> I think I have overwhelmed you. Ooh, no. Yeah. Mm. There we go. Okay, I just made a super freaking long piece of text. Remember what we were doing two weeks ago? Where I was taking, I'm going to take my masking tool, make a circle, which looks fine, yeah, full size. And if you recall, I can path options. I can put that text onto that path. Mask. Okay. Now I'm going to reverse the path, obviously, so I have it on the outside. Uh, let me move that background back a bit so it's not in our way. C space. And also, I'm going to turn off the light so I can actually show you what I'm doing. Lights are wonderful for finished products, but when you're working on things, you want to put them on last. Okay, back to that. All right, so right now I've got my text on the lettering. So if I were to take that and hit rotate, like so, you know, I could cause that to you know, I could rotate that around. I don't want to do that, not that rotate. But we can animate the text around this thing. Now, if I were to There's my margin tool. It's getting easy to make my text rotate. In fact, I think I will do a quick animation. And make it rotate a couple times by manipulating the margin. Just so you guys can see what I'm doing. That's good. So you can see. There it goes. All right. So that's rotating around. do what I wanted to do. I'm doing this in prop two off the top of my head. Oops, definitely don't want that. Okay.
forgive me for just taking a second here to I'm trying to do is get some letters to pop up. Oh, I should have practiced this. Yeah, I see the question there. I'm trying to get it to do what I want it to do. This is something I did not practice today. I apologize for that. Okay, so I'm going to actually cheat. And I like cheating sometimes. Get some presets. Character animation. Text. 3D text. There we go. When in doubt, <laughs> always have the things made first. All right, so I just deleted my text, which was not what I wanted to do. 3D, that's what I do want to do. If you recall, this is a review from two weeks ago. Go animators, browse presets, give it a second to launch bridge. Do that. Go away. Okay, so we're going to go to text, 3D animations. Rotate circle. That's the one I want. Voila. So now I have what I was trying to do in the first place. <laughs> there we go, everybody. All right. So again, I'm going to do rotation here for the layer. Transform. Rotate. Why rotate? Wrong one. Oh, I see. Anchor point. Got two masks there. It has my old mask still. Better not go like that. That's much better. <laughs> oh, I confused the whole little thing. Poor little baby. Let's try that again from scratch. When in doubt, restart. Definitely. I do that. I guess that was the yeah. Well, that is super small, <laughs> but you can see what I was trying to get at. is basically the text and let's scale this up a little bit. Maybe not that much. Here's the 
keyframes. Let's stretch this out a bit so we can actually see it go around. And because the mask itself is so small, it actually has letters overlapping and stuff. Uh, this has nothing to do with the gradient. I'm not sure what your question is. Um, is there a way to change the colors of the, of the text in front of the in front of the cylinder as it's going around? Well, there's several options we have there. Hold on for just one minute. Under mask, I'm going to try and make this bigger. broke it. Okay. To have a different look between the front and the back. Okay, that was a good, you know, that is a good question. I don't need to rotate that, but it's just faster to scale it up and try to figure out what the angles are. There we go. Okay, let's think about this. The question is how to change the colors from front to back. Well, because this is 3D, I could just simply add a light. Move that light back a bit because this is, how about something like that? Now I could go in and play with the coloring of the lettering and do all sorts of crazy things like that. But of course adding that light just, and like all other things, if I wanted to, I could, so I choose the text layer, go down to my material options, turn on cast shadows, and no, there is not a way to have it automatically do that, which is I was thought stupid, sorry. And now the lighting really is kind of weird because now you can see the shadows. Now that's truly weird. Let's type something smaller, shall we? I'll do my blood again. Say we're making a horror film. Now that's a crazy looking title sequence, don't you think? But basically, one of the things I was trying to bring up when I was doing this, and I, sorry I wasn't prepped, was and there are pre-made um, animations because, because when you have a 3D layer, you can create the text to do for Z-Space now which gives you all sorts of crazy options above and beyond the normal look and feel that we were doing two weeks ago. Because you're creating a parallax view of things, it just gives you this wonderful, I have no idea whether rotations are not. You know, to activate a, all those animators, so I'm going to hide my blood, type in something new. Okay. Once again, I got to make that a 3D layer. Now that 
we'll start moving forward and backwards. But under my animate tour, if you recall all this from two weeks ago, if I choose any one of these things, it will only be 2D. Unless I hit this enable pre-character 3D, notice down my timeline, I now have a new symbol here. It's not just the layer that's 3D, it's actually the character animations are also 3D. And it does this weird double cube symbol to let you know that that's happened. What that means now is when I go to my position, scale, rotation, opacity, whatever, I now have an X, Y, Z position. So when I choose my range selectors, if you go with the range selectors, yeah, I should make that red because you will not see it. Let's make it green, uh, yellow, dirty yellow, brownish. There we go. Hey, it didn't take. Hold on. Cancel. Select all my text. There we go. So now we'll go back down and range selectors. Actually, for this, I can do this in one view. Okay. You can see why people invest in those bl in bloody uh, two monitors. Makes your life so much easier. You can have so many views up. Anyhow, so I now have a range selector that's one character in length. If you recall, if I move my offset, now right now I've made no changes, but I can now go with Z space. So what's happening now, offset there. Start before, go over a few seconds, go to the other side. So now my animation is moving the characters backwards and forward in Z space. If I look, that, look at that from a custom view, oops, beyond, let's try that again. Uh, that's where they're vanishing, my background was. Go back to camera view. You get the idea. Again, everything comes back to, you know, things that we've already covered. So by doing this, background, key for position. back far enough so my layers don't go through the background. It's just a fun way of, you know, making things. And you can see that's a radically different look than just playing with scale. Because if we were to have done just scale as opposed to without the 3D, you know, the layers would just get smaller. You know, there is a big difference between doing things in 3D and playing moving things bigger, making things bigger and smaller. Okay. So once again, to repeat what I was trying to say earlier, was when you play with text and you want to do with animators, to get these to change from 2D to 3D, you've got to go in and enable 3D characterization. Okay. By the way, the circling letters and changing colors, you could also get in and animating the uh, various fill colors too, to do some particular looks and things. Strange ways of doing things, but having fun. One of the other nifty things about uh, the animators, and so I'm gonna go ahead and go in here and add blur. Oops, I accidentally added a second animator. I don't want that, I want this happening at the same time. Choose animator one, hit add, blur, there we go. So when they go farther away, I want them to blur out. So well, something a little fun there, et cetera.
Okay. So that's a basic overview of doing things in 3D. Okay. You can activate 3D by simply adding in the uh, cubes, making the layers 3D. That doesn't make the objects 3D. That's a whole different kettle of fish. But once you've done 3D, you can then start adding in lights and cameras to give you various moves and fields. You also want to keep in mind the difference between the camera view versus whether other view you have. The other thing is when you're first doing this starting out, I've got to say is most people like stick to the custom view and you've got to constantly be changing this to figure out where to line things up at. And you also have to zoom in, zoom out to make sure all the pixels are correct. Otherwise you're going to have issues. You know, this is not static. You're going to have to play with it to get used to it, et cetera. Okay. Once you get the hang of it, the possibilities are just really amazing. So there's a lot of fun things to play with. So what I want you to do over the next week between finishing your second projects uh, is to download these files and just make the layers 3D and start moving things around. There's nothing beats practice with these things. Now, do I take a side step here and look over to the chat screen? Uh, one of the things I'm th going to be probably thinking of doing this week is I'm going to aff the, the offer basically office hours on Canvas. This is the ability to post, you know, that I'll be online like one, one hour or so. And you guys can, one at a time, sign up in 15-minute increments and things like that. I don't, I'm still trying to figure out my work schedule for this week. But uh, I'll, we'll email you to let you know when you can do that. Okay. So basically, down the road, uh, a day or so, you can go to Canvas. Okay. Conference now. And there'll be appointment bookings here. And you'll find a thing and then you can just sign up if you're available if you want to talk to me. I'll make that time available later on this week. So you can share it. We can share screens and do it one on one as opposed to doing it in this massive collection of people and stuff. And you can ask me questions and do things like that. How does that sound for everybody? Is, it, is that going to work? Question I have, of course, is would during the, okay, for this week, I could actually do some things during the day, you know, like in the afternoon versus evenings. Which do you think, just as a little, you know, put, type in, type in either afternoon or evenings or, you know, you don't care type of thing to let me know what you think, which would work better for you. Or don't care is also perfectly acceptable. answer for everybody. Evenings. Okay, afternoon or evening. This is something we'll experiment with as we move forward through the semester. Traditionally, I have, you know, set aside time half an hour before class, the breaks, and, you know, I normally let the class go early so I can work with people one-on-one -on -one in the classroom. Since that's no longer an option, um, just want to make sure. So, okay, I will email you once I figure out which night of the rest of the week I have. Obviously, I'd like you to finish off your projects number two. Hopefully, you've started them at this point. And again, I want to emphasize that you do not have to use 3D environment for your projects number two, okay? Next week, after you've turned in projects number two, uh, I will also ha immediately hand out project number three.
And yes, I will stick around, okay, for some time for people who have questions and whatnot. I can even, we can even turn on your microphone so you can ask me directly and save yourself typing and whatnot, but I'll control your microphone so multiple people are not. Try to talk simultaneously on top of each other. Okay. So it's a little bit after nine o'clock. I think I've given you a lot to think about and stuff. So let's go ahead and get into Q&A. I'm going to stop the recording at this point. Give me a second here. And I'll email you out as soon as I get the information. All right, I'll stop this.